Hello, everybody. Welcome to Conversations with Canadians. On today's episode of the podcast, we have my friend Eli Martyr. Eli is a professional stuntman in the film industry. He also has a YouTube channel, The Free Melon Society, which talks about health, wellness, and spirituality. We get into all sorts of interesting things on this episode, such as Eli's diet. He pretty much only eats fruit. Crazy, right? We talk about calming the mind, the benefits of fasting, lucid dreaming, and astral projection. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Eli Martyr. Eli, good to see you, man. How you doing? Uh, Michael, thank you so much. It's really good to see you too, man. It's been forever. It's been such a long time, uh, you know, going to school together. And it just like, it's amazing how fast time flies when you're not paying attention. Really, so, right? Like I was just, I was thinking that the other day, it's been a ver- like, how long has it been? It's been what, almost 20 years since, hi- 20 years oh, maybe God. since high school, something, yeah. something insane. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> In preparation, when I was thinking about talking to you, there's something I always wanted to ask you. I remember you used to have these videos, right? And you had these videos mm-hmm. of yourself on New Year's going into the wilderness. Yes. What were you getting up to? Like, what, what do you still do that? And what was that all about? I still do. I actually did. did, did. Um, for me, I, I just, there, I'm a very simple guy, a very simple person. And I started to really appreciate uh, quietude, you know, in, 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 I guess in line with whatever spiritual development I was making and studying. And I always find that, well, not always, but in reigning in the new year and bringing in the new year, I I started to really um, kind of self-focus a bit and take some time for myself and just be isolated and uh, time for reflection. And uh, nothing really allows you to do that, like going into the woods. It's just so peaceful, so quiet. And it allows you time to be with yourself without all the noise and clutter of just everything, everything going on. I like, I'm, I'm social, I like socializing, I like people, and I like parties, I go to parties um, as well, so like dancing and all that kind of stuff. It's all great, it's, all, it's a lot of fun, but every once in a while, I like to do the polar opposite of that too, just kind of hermetically seal yourself away somewhere, go somewhere where there's absolutely nobody so that you can hear nothing but your own thoughts, just be with yourself, and I've always found forest excursions satisfy that in a way that um, not really anything else can. So, um, And I document a lot of my vacations for that purpose. You know, you can look back on them and have a nice memory, but also it builds character in uh, in an interesting way. So, Do you go yeah. to the same spot <laughs> every year? No, no, different, you know, different spots. And, uh, and not always, you know, in New Year's, different times of the year as well. But, excuse me, the last couple of New Year's I've, I've, I found that I like to keep to myself a bit at New Year's now, as opposed to you know going on partying, um, which which you can do at any time really. Where'd you go this year? Um, this this year was pretty quiet. No, this year I didn't do too much. It was just uh, it was just at home with the family. Oh, okay, so you didn't. Uh, so this year, pretty much yeah. So last year would have would have been when I went to uh, I believe it was just up north somewhere in uh, here in in Canada. Well, Toronto. We, we live in Toronto, um, so northern, uh, in north of Toronto, several hours, two, three hours or so. Um, I literally just went on the map and just looked for a big plot of green on the map, and was like, ah, look at this. There's a big forest over here. I'll just go, and that, that's what I did. I just went, found a hotel close by, and then spent my New Year's exploring, uh, exploring the woods. That's awesome. Do you do you set goals on on the New Year? Like, do you or do you like have a like a list you go through of things that happened in the previous previous year and like set intentions for the new year and things like that? Um, you know what, what I do is generally there are things that I'm working on in, in the season, like in the off season. It's funny how it works. I don't want to get into it too much because it's a little bit off topic, but um, we kind of have these as beings that live on planet earth, we're subjects to certain influences as you know, as as the world goes uh, goes around, and one of those influences is a tendency for inner inner development during the calm quiet of the uh, where the where the where we're in the winter season 
essentially. And then in the summer, when uh, during the spring there's new growth, new vitality and whatnot, you find that there's a lot of physical development in, in the summer. And in the winter, you find emotional, intellectual development. A lot of people, if you think about it, you might find that that's true in in your personal life. We tend to do a lot of inner reflection during the quietude of the winter and then a lot of external development, physical development during the summer. And so what I do for New Year's is essentially I just kind of think and dwell upon all of the types of development that I've been working on in the in the winter and just just allow it to kind of seep in, keep quiet, and uh, try to bring about wh uh, whatever it is I'm working on for for the remainder of the year. So I don't actually make a, a come up with a list at that time at New Year's. Right. It's more just a continuation of stuff that I'm developing over over that season. That's interesting. It's if true. That makes sense. Yeah, totally. It's true about the quietude. Like I found, you know, for years now, I've been running without any music or anything and this includes my longer runs that'll be yeah. you know 90 minutes you know up to two hours sometimes no music like i never would have thought in a million right. years that that was possible but you know yeah. i run in the morning so that's that's one thing so it's always nice and quiet but i look nice. forward to it like i look forward to that time just to be in my own space like if a bunny runs across in front of me i get to like watch it scurry along you know you get lost in your right. thoughts or you think about nothing sometimes like you're just going right, right? it's so yeah, i can understand that the the seeking the quietude and sometimes it's hard yeah. to find that especially around your own house right 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 yeah there's there's something to be said about uh the state of contemplation where you're not you're not focusing on one particular thing uh, or you're not concentrating too hard but you're also not doing the other extreme where you're just doing absolutely nothing so quiet quieting the mind you know the meditative thing uh, where you quiet the mind but nothing's happening absolutely nothing if you kind of fuse the two blend the two so let's say you have a particular question that you like answered what you do is you'd find a quiet place where there are no distractions and you can you can sit in a, a, however is comfortable in classic meditation uh, fashion and but instead of quieting your mind so that you just try to focus on nothing happening and no thoughts coming in you allow yourself just just that one particular uh thing that you're trying to have answered and you don't you don't aggressively focus but you just kind of let that question float around in your mind and and see what happens and it's amazing. It's kind of hard to describe, but doing that, it's like a quiet contemplation. You'd be amazed at some of the answers that you can come, come up with. So it, it would be kind of like peeling back an onion. So let's just say I'm addicted to chocolate, right? And I want to really get at the source of why I'm addicted to chocolate. What you do is you do exactly as I said. You sit down, quiet down your mind, and then just ask your question. I'm addicted to chocolate. Why am I addicted? What is it about you, the question? Will come, oh, what is it about chocolate that's so fascinating? Hmm, is it the this and this? Is it that? Oh, you know what? I like chocolate only when I'm watching TV. Okay, so what is? And you just go down this path in your mind, hmm. right? You'll come up with answers that you that might shock you, you know. And it doesn't take. It's it's challenging, but it's it's simple, but it's not easy. But if you do it, um, yeah, it's really interesting things can happen. So. I find that quieting anyway. of your mind exercise super difficult to get into because, you know, yeah. as, as much as you can say, hey, I can do this. Like I can, you know, hang off the window seal for a week if I had to, you know, but when it comes to quieting your mind for five minutes, <laughs> you're just like, why yeah. are all these thoughts flying around? Like <laughs> what is going on? Do, is that something with practice yes. you would say gets easier and easier? Or is that just it, like... It, uh, you know, the, uh, the prevalence of a noisy, confused mind. Right. It, it's, it's a bit of both. And there are a lot of factors that go into it. So uh, yes, there is the practice element. Okay. That's absolutely a contributing factor. Um, one of the things that people don't want to hear is that your diet and lifestyle are, are very, very influential. 
um, when when you have influences, stimulating influences circulating around in your body, they can they can create noise in in the mind. But when the body becomes uh, purified and cleansed of a lot of the riffraff, stimulating um, toxins and metabolic byproducts and uh, salts and seasonings and uh, all sorts of stimulating effects, okay, that excite the tissues into, into action. When those are removed from the body, all of a sudden there's this very, very comforting calm that comes upon uh, upon you, not only your body but but your mind and your thinking. You become very, very placid. Um, you know, equanimity doesn't you know doesn't break for any reason. Why? And uh, so why why does your yeah why why does it have that effect like why when you get rid of all the toxins and everything or does it have right. that calming effect right yeah because these influences when your body okay let me i'll tell you i'll tell you your, your law of stimulation okay so when something stimulates when unnaturally stimulates the body it weakens to the same degree so let's say it's, and I, I know I'm enemy number one in the world when I, when I bring this up, but coffee, okay? <laughs> Just as an example. Um, coffee is a wild stimulant. It's not the best thing to be taking into the body in terms of optimal human health. Okay, so when you take it, when coffee goes into your body, it ramps up the metabolic rate, you know, your heart rate speeds up, uh, but it's it's doing that because your body is extremely intelligent. Your body wants to ramp up the metabolic processes in the body in order to get rid of the stimulant as fast as possible. Hmm. That's actually why we get the kick, the excitation and kick uh, with coffee. It's because What's really happening, again, is your body trying to get that stuff out as fast as possible. And so in order to do that, it's got to ramp up the metabolic rate. The coffee doesn't give you energy. It simply taxes the energy that's already in your body. So unlike an apple, you eat the apple and you the apple is yielding you energy. You are gaining from it. But when we stimulate our bodies with non-food, like fake foods like alcohol and, and, you know, that kind of thing, and coffee, you're actually taxing your body more so. And so um, the, the energy generating pathways become eroded and degraded. There are, there are waste products associated with taking in stimulants in the body. And so you, you, you get this type of turbulence in the tissues waste products that reside in the cells themselves that compromise their function okay and as all these things are circulating and stuffed in your body irrevocably they have an effect on the mind because it's all it's all connected okay so with all of those toxins um, uh, um residing in the tissues it it clutters the body and it clutters the thinking and so fumigating and purging and getting rid of all that stuff it allows the channels of energy, the energy channels in the body to flow unobstructed rather than obstructed. And so you get less clutter in the mind, less nervous, uh, nervous excitation, less anxiety, all of these things. So do you have to intentionally um, purge the body of these toxins that find their ways into the cells and things like that? Or does that happen naturally? And the only reason why they keep coming back is because you keep putting them back in. Or are they sort of there unless you do a cleanse or like completely change your diet? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a good question. And uh, yes, you, in, in the 21st century now, with the way we live life, we're so beset and we're so inundated by just a toxic lifestyle. And essentially a, a culture that promotes as completely normal a pathological lifestyle and diet and, and just everything everything is wrong <laughs> so um you would need to take an additional steps towards detoxing uh, in order to, in order to get at um, the what really provides health and wellness however that being said 
the the body okay i always use this example you raise your arm you grab a knife and you cut yourself and, and you you make a deep wound in your arm you don't need to do anything for the natural intelligence that governs your body to start slowly healing that wound up it's magic it's literally magic and you know it's just so baffling you know what our bodies do i mean creating life i mean that is something that no but no i don't care what kind of scientist you are we can't wrap our heads around the intelligence and the guiding force that is at at work in creating a human being you know it, it's insane so that force works in your body at all times, nonstop, 24 hours a day. It is always trying to bring about the best health and wellness in the system. So in a sense, you don't have to do anything. This force is always working at purifying and, and cleansing. Always, 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 always. So what the cleanser is doing, or what the, what the, uh, the health advocate is doing when they, when they say you're going to go on a detox is they're not actually doing anything. What they're doing is they're simply removing uh, the input of toxins and the input of, of uh, life-halting influences and putting that on hold, putting that in abeyance so that that grand intelligence, the same one that I was just talking about that repairs your skin, it has a chance to go into the tissues and get and do all the things that it normally wants to do that it doesn't, isn't able to do when we are too occupied uh, with dealing with other things like digestion, complex digestion, um, stress work, all these influences that, that tax energy. We, we take a break from that, that. And then in taking that break, your body has enough energy to say, oh, okay, we've got all this energy now. Let's get rid of stuff. And so that's essentially what a detox is. So how, how often would you recommend that somebody does a detox? And for how long? Uh, it, yes. Well, there are, diff there are different types of detoxes. There are different cleanses. So it's a bit of a spectrum. Um, so Let's say for uh, the newbie. The easiest way to... Yeah, for, okay. So for, for a newbie, um, all, what, we do, what we can do is just give um, a contextual field because it's a spectrum. Um, on the one hand, let's say, okay, on the one hand, excessive eating and excessive indulgence. This is what causes disease, okay? So excessive, just, just loading the body with every single horrible influence you possibly could. That would be the worst of it. And on the way on the other end, you have doing absolutely nothing. So f fasting, um, um, uh, lying down, relaxing, just doing absolutely nothing. That would be the other end of detox, the most, the most extreme type of cleansing is to just the complete abstinence of all these influences. No different than sleeping, the complete abs absence of activity, and being wakeful, doing everything that we do in life, right? These two polar opposites, right? Where one is the regenerative process, and the other is the expenditure process, sleeping, being awake. It's the same thing with health. Eating, not eating. These two polar opposites, the not eating state, one giving you complete rest, and the other is inputting energy to be used for, you know, uh, for, for everything we do. So, and there's everything in between, as we get closer and closer and closer to the state of just completely not eating, you have all the different detoxes. So you have juice cleanses, you have uh, intermittent uh, feeding, which is getting really, really popular these days. Uh, you have all of these things, oh, go on an, go on an apple uh, diet for three days, do all of these types of cleansing. They, the more effective the cleanse it is because it's closer and closer and closer to that complete rest state. Okay, so that's that's what denotes the effectiveness of a cleanse is how close it comes to a, a absolute one hundred percent rest, which would be a fast, a complete fast. And now I'll answer your question: How often should you do this? Um, it, it, it again, depends on what you're doing, but let's just say in terms of a water fast, you could do a three day, three to five day water fast, maybe once a month. Um, and that would give you fantastic cleansing. And then, of course, you'd have to be mindful of what you're eating and uh, putting into your body in the period between the fasts. 
because if you just go back to eating garbage after a water fast, you kind of, you know, make the uh, whatever you gained uh, minimal. What do you think about uh, intermittent feeding? And I use that word, you know, carefully because I know you have a a problem with intermittent fasting. (laughs) You say it's not actually (laughs) fasting, but intermittent fasting, as us uh, regular minions call it. We can use, yeah. Let's just use the term. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll say intermittent fasting because that's what's commonly, you know, understood. Yeah. What do you think about it? Um, it's it's fantastic. It, it's fantastic. The, uh, what I what I say is intermittent fasting is not necessarily fasting because the human body is is designed very very well. It's not designed to be taking in food constantly throughout the day. So with intermittent fasting, what we're saying is you have this eight hour window. Or less, or more, give or take. There's always different, you know, different uh, uh, interpretations. But the average 16-8 intermittent fast, where you're eating for eight hours and then you're getting 16 hours of rest. That's essentially what it is. The reason I say that's not fasting is because it's not fasting. That is just the normal pattern that that humans and <laughs> even animals in, in the animal kingdom would have whereby you eat for a particular period of the day but then there's a sufficient amount um a sufficient time allotted to complete rest so that the 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 body has time to deal with the digestive elements in the food absorb them get it ready for for you know to produce energy for the for the organism or for the human being and then the next day when you've absorbed all it is that you need to then you can eat it again so the 16-8 um, pattern, it's uh, it's just normal. <laughs> that that's what it always should be. It's just that we've given it this term, and the problem is we've aff- we've affixed the term fasting to intermittent fasting, and now when we use that term indiscriminately, we start to um, we start to take what fasting is. So if I were to Fasting is just a period of, of no food, okay? mm. a period of time where you go with no food. And there are certain physiological things that happen when you're fasting. But in order to get at that, at the, those physiological phenomena, those extremely healing and cleansing asp- um, uh, phenomena, you need to go without food for much longer than 16 hours. That's not even a day. Okay. So, how long um, do you, you have need to, go- to go for? How long would you have to go without to, food? To, to, right. So to get at um, some actual, you know, good healing, you're you're looking at a three to five day fast. Really? Okay. At, at least, yeah, three to five day fast. Um, anything fasting works on a momentum principle. It's like the longer you go, the the deeper, the deeper, the deeper the detox goes. If you're only fasting for sixteen hours, basically you get the ball rolling. But it doesn't really start moving down the mountain. So it's like your body's like getting ready to, to detox and says, all right, here we go. Uh, oh, no. Food. All right. that, that's <laughs> Take essentially your skis what's, off. what's <laughs> happening. Yeah. Now, it is very healthy and it does give you a break. But that break, uh, what, I, what I would try to teach whoever I'm speaking to is that is that's just very normal. That's the natural cycle. So um, if you actually want to start reaching into the cells and reaching into the tissues and start pulling out the wastes that are trapped there that don't get time uh that 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 don't that the body doesn't have access to unless it's in the state of rest if you want to do that you need to you need to do a water fast for a bit longer and that just doesn't really start to happen at a deep fundamental way unless you fast for longer um yeah so I don't know if it's a placebo, but when I do it, I find that mm. I have more energy. And I typically, like, I do, I do yeah. my best to eat that way all the time with, you know, a long right. window of non-eating. And I find, yeah. you know, I wake up better. Like, I, I tend to wake up early because I, I work out and stuff in the morning before work. And yeah. I find that, you know, any time I eat later than I should, I wake up and I have way less energy. But if I actually yeah. do the proper... You know, I try and not eat after, say, five o'clock in the afternoon. Like, I feel great when I wake up. But if the dinner's at seven o'clock, forget it. Like, I'll wake up, I'm sluggish, regardless of what I eat, right? It could just be, you know, quinoa and vegetables. I'm still going to feel 
way more tired than normal. Is that normal or yeah. is that a placebo? That is, no, that is not a placebo. That is, that is, that's, you're experiencing what, um, what the best state is. You, the later you eat, you, your digestion can't shut off completely during, during sleep. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's still working. So that's why you feel sluggish because you have to imagine you go to sleep, but if you've got stuff that's just been placed into your body, your body has to keep expending energy in order to get at and digest that food. But if you cut that, if you cut your, make your last meal earlier on in the day and that digestive work gets done while you're awake so that there's less stuff to do when you go to sleep, now you have more energy available to you so you get up and you feel holy crap i feel amazing right? right it's because you weren't working all night and so no it's definitely not a not a placebo it's a very very healthy thing to do to eat dinner as early as possible and allow yourself so for the average person um try i would say try to have your last meal such that you get two to three hours before you go to bed and that will put you in a better place to effectively digest your food get better sleep, your, your sleep will be much, much more peaceful and much less undisturbed if you don't have stuff going on in your stomach. Um, so that's another thing. It, a good sleep, right? Good sleep is beyond essential. So um, yeah, um, getting your last meal in a couple hours before you go to bed is going to really, really help your energy levels in the morning. That makes a lot of sense. So how do you eat? So how? how yeah, what, like what, what do you eat? What do you eat? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, for me, I'm I'm a I eat very 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 simply. Um, I I try to align my my diet with my physiological uh, limitations and endowments as nature as nature has put you know has has um, has created them. What does that mean? So I eat. It, yeah. So I, I'll, I'll I'll explain. Um, all all animals, all species on planet Earth. They all have a very, very, um, very, very narrow definition of what foods they eat. Okay, their biology restricts them from from certain foods, and it allows them to eat only a particular class of foods. So, you know, if we were to suggest that a hummingbird um, is going to be more healthy if you feed it um, a hyena carcass, right? We know that that's ridiculous. It just sounds so stupid. Right. right? It's like, I'm not going to, no zookeeper is going to feed a, a hummingbird, you know, hyena meat, right? It's just not, we know innately that that's absurd because a hummingbird has a very particular hummingbird diet that its biology allows it to, to get access to in the absence of everything else. Right. No one's feeding hummingbird sushi or, or um, uh, whatever. Yeah. You know what I mean? So all all animals, all organisms on planet Earth have this have this um, biological um, prescription for a very very small uh, class of foods. And it turns out, and I know I'm speaking to your audience here, so I you know I don't want to be uh, too out there, but it turns oh. out that yeah, human physiology is is designed is best designed is geared towards eating simple fruits and leafy green vegetables okay that that is what our system is is ideally designed to do i can get into all sorts of reasons why that would be and proofs that you can find in your body that anybody you don't need any sort of scientific you know understanding is just like very obvious comments what is stuff. one of them uh, one of the one proofs. of them uh, yeah. yeah this is a good one right here so hands Fruit eating animals have have hands, things that grasp and are able to pick. You know this fine uh, kind of dexterity that you have with the hands. This allows you to pick at things and eat them. If you were an herbivore, you would have hooves or 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 you know these big cloven hooves or uh, or paws or something, right? Um, not paws. I think mean, that's more of carnivore omnivore. But if you were an herbivore, you'd have some sort of bludgeoning type of <laughs> type of um, right. uh, appendage here you wouldn't have hands if you were a carnivore you'd have paws and claws okay if you were an omnivore you'd have paws and claws only fruit eaters have this these hands okay um there uh, you can go down the list uh your dental structure 
Okay, if you were an, an herbivore, like a giraffe or a, you know hippo or whatever, um, isn't there cows? A, is there a connection? Say it again? I thought I heard once that there isn't there some connection to the fact that human beings see color. Um, yeah. To to the yeah. they that developed or evolved rather to pick out ripe fruit. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. If you were if you were a carnivore, you would not be seeing color, right? Carnivore, it's it's much easier because they their vision is based on movement, right? right? They want to be able to pick out movement, so they have this kind of uh, almost grayscale type of look at the world, and that that kind of colorless world it allows them to see very particular movements, right? So um, prey species would have a hard time camouflaging themselves so if you you know to us it, it fools us but for a carnivore whose eyes are tuned to very very small and fine movements they can see that very very well it allows them to see in the dark very well but the reason we have uh, our color vision is because we have to be able to distinguish the the cherry tomato from all the rest of the green foliage in the bush and so we can identify it and pick it up right so the fact that you have color vision um, the fact that your eyes are open when you're born. If you were born as a human being and you, as a baby, you had the ability to open your eyes, you, you cannot be a carnivore or omnivore. When carnivores and omnivore babies are born, their eyes are completely sealed because um, they, uh, they're born prematurely. They're all born prematurely so that the mother is not burdened with a huge uh, belly and a huge lengthy pregnancy because she needs to hunt to get food that's interesting i never knew and, that yeah herb, herbivores and uh fruit eating species because they don't need to hunt to get their food they can afford a lengthy pregnancy where the where the child is developing for longer okay and that's why herbivores and fruit eating species frugivores like the great apes which is what we would be um we have we have lengthier uh, gestation times where the ba our babies are more developed when they come out as opposed to the the babies of cougars and dogs and, and, and whatnot and the big cats uh the, you know you can go down uh, your nipples let's talk about nipples if your nipples are on your chest congratulations you're not an herbivore you're not a carnivore you're not an omnivore right? <laughs> all of these all of these uh In case species, you didn't know. they have their nipples on, <laughs> on their on their abdomen right all these all these animals have their nipples on their abdomen uh, it's only the higher species that have the nipples on the on the chest, like the great apes and the gorillas. Um, it, 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 honestly, it goes it goes on and on. Right. And on. There are all these biological markers that tell you that you are not of the other classes, and so that's why I eat the way I do because I'm I'm simply just trying to align my behaviors with what nature designed me to do. So, do you eat it, um, it really you eat fruits and vegetables, or do you just eat fruit? Yes. Um, I, I, I definitely, uh, eat way more fruit right. than, than vegetables, but, uh, vegetables are on the menu. They, you know, they are, they, they go in clean. Our digestive physiology is able to deal with vegetables. Um, but not as many of the dense, hard vegetables that require cooking and processing that most vegans and vegetarians would consider part of the diet, right. the vegetables I would eat. The simple, easy, easy to eat um, in the raw state, lettuces and leafy green vegetables. So leafy green vegetables are are good for me, and um, they don't require any cooking or processing. Eats, and uh, and so those are the vegetables I would consider uh, suitable. Um, so I and, I and I do do that every once in a while, but most of the time I'm eating very very simply of just single item meals so I, i'll let's give some examples yeah, a like, meal for me would be a bowl oh, sorry. i was just going to say give a let's give, give me an example of what you would eat in a in a full yeah, day example okay sure so in a full day uh, i could eat a bowl of blueberries and maybe i could have one or two uh cantaloupes okay that could be a full day of eating that's it um i could yeah yeah that's it I could, and this, I've been doing this, this is, I'm in my fifth year of doing this right now. I'm, I'm still an athlete. I, I do acro. I do, I, I mean, I do, uh, <laughs> I, I work in film. I'm, I work as a, as a stunt guy. 
So I've been involved in athletics and movement for my whole life. And I, I, I do all of these things, I'm very fit, very active. Uh, are you weaker? Do lifting, do all so am I, are you weaker? Than you were before you started this, like uh, say six years ago when you were heavier and... Right, right, right. Yeah, so uh, I, was, I was a meat eater and an anything goes eater. And uh, I weighed much, much, much more. Uh, I was able, yeah, so my, my raw strength, like the, if you were chalking up the numbers on a bench press, let's say, right, I could definitely lift more raw power uh, before, right. beforehand. But giving that up and, and starting to eat in a much, much healthier, cleaner way, uh, I lost lots of weight. And I and I cleaned out my body, and the advantages that came with that, right, were such that I would never dream of giving them up, at the expense for, yeah, the ability to lift as sheer sheer raw weight with uh, with a bench press, let's say. So yes, number wise, numbers wise, um, I let, I'll just use bench press to just stay there. That number went down for sure, but you're you're you do not lose. Uh, like you're strong, you can. You're still strong. You're still. You have great endurance. You can recover. Like you'd, you'd be amazed at how fast you recover from from exercise. Your sleep improves. Everything improves. Uh, you can't get sick. Just you're just absolutely immune from any sort. Of, I haven't had one single sick day. No, not even not even sick day. I've had I have yet to experience one single day of feeling kind of under the weather um, in five years. You know, it, oh, yeah. Yeah. Since I started doing this, um, all the mucus congestion, it just leaves your body. You know, you have clean pipes in and out every single day without fail. You haven't used tissues. You know, you don't need tissue paper at all. Um, your, your bowel movements are spotlessly clean and, and no odors at all. It's just this this internal purity that comes over you. you. You know, once you start experiencing it, you would never go back to a, to a denser, heavier way of eating just for the advantages of, you know, a bigger bench press. Right? And it's not that you don't have strength. But you can, I mean, I do, I do handstand push-ups every day. I sprint every day. I, I you know, you're flexible. You, you're strong. You just, yeah. So um, the advantages definitely outweigh any benefits. There's, and I'd like to say that there's a distinction to be made between fitness and health. Right. Uh, fitness, you, you can have a high level of fitness and have an awfully, awfully adulterated body. Right. Um, you, you have professional athletes dying all the time because of health complications. And on the outside, they look fantastic. Health and fitness are not the same, okay? However, in order to have a high degree of health, you do need fitness. So you do need to have an active body in order to, to get at good health. But you do not necessarily have to have a clean body in order to be fit, okay? So because fitness is just a, a response to, to stressors, to muscul musculoskeletal stressors or whatnot, you can do eating anything. You can have a McDonald's diet exclusively and you can still be fit right but um your your body on the inside is is, is screaming and that's because your body often store well all the time stores poisons and waste products in the muscle tissue itself and so it can on the outside look like health um but you know it's not and i learned this because i was never never fat i was always lean muscular uh, I appear. I, I appeared many, many years ago, as I do now, just bigger muscles. But within my first week, two weeks of eating, of eating uh, just high fruits, some veggies here and there, no cooked food, no seasonings, no oils, salts, all of it, just left it all behind. Oh my God! Within a week and a half, two weeks, just weight flew off my body. Too fast for it to have been uh, fat or or muscle loss, right? You you don't lose muscle like this. Your body's very intelligent; it doesn't do that. What was happening is I was my the tissues were getting cleansed, 
the muscle tissues themselves were getting squeezed and cleansed of impurities that are that were lodged in there. So uh, and so I, I could see that very very clearly. So it's not that I lost too much fat and muscle. It's the waste products that were jammed in all of these tissues that was getting shuttled out for elimination. Yeah. Wow. So it's almost um, like you have no idea how much you really weigh if you're... That's, yes. That's... Yes. Yeah. So if you're consuming yes, all pretty... these products, let's say that um, inject Correct. these toxins into you and then they get trapped in your cells and, and in your muscle tissue, like how could you ever know right. your true weight? Like my true weight could be... 25 pounds less than I am right now like correct correct the average person the average person is carrying um between 20 or more pounds 30 pounds 40 pounds of waste in the body and and that's a lot 30 pounds is a a lot lot of of weight like (laughs) that's a that's a lot that is a ton of weight the average child in uh in North America the average kid already has heart disease by the time they're 10 years old. When I say heart disease, what? not that it's heart disease that's about to, yes, not that it's about to actually kill them, but they have the underpinnings of, of um, uh, deposits in their arteries at the age of 10 years old. It's, yes, that early. Um, if We know this when uh, we have infant mortality, uh, in, you know, kids die for whatever reason, right. accidents or whatnot, and uh, if you do autopsies on them, you find that, oh my God, these kids have heart disease, or this adult has heart disease. Um, there were, there were, uh, I think, oh God, I, I can't remember my timeline here, but uh, there was one of the Olympics. Uh, there were, there were, um, uh, there were a bunch of people that died, a bunch of Olympia, uh, Olympic athletes that had died, and they did autopsies on on all of them, and they found that almost every single one of them had heart disease olympic olympic athlete really and um yeah they yeah they looked into all of them and found that they had fatty deposits fatty streaks that were building up in in the arteries it's just they hadn't lived on planet earth long enough for that to continue to build up so that it killed them you know i i believe that Um, i have sorry to interrupt i have a, a a friend of mine 41 years old this past summer he was out gardening and he died of a heart attack. Yeah. And this guy, he would right. do our um, IT stuff at work, right? And I remember when he would come in, right. we would exclusively talk about the gym. And he would play basketball right. in the morning, like he would work out. And I remember he had lost a bunch of weight, blah, 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 blah. And then I heard this happen. I was like, holy cow. This is a guy who it almost seemed like he obsessed over fitness. Yeah. The, going back to your point right. previously, right? It's like obsessing over over fitness, but yet, you know, and there could have been a genetic component there that he was unaware of, of course, sure. right? But I did find sure. it interesting, like yeah. when I looked back in his pictures, I always, he wasn't always like a lean guy, right? It's, he like mm-hmm. fluctuated a lot, it seemed, in body weight and stuff like that. I don't really yeah. know what his diet was like or anything. And like I said, it could be genetic. This could be like purely anecdotal, but you know, it just like it kind of shocked me. And you hear stories about this all the time: people in their thirties, forties, twenties, probably a bit more rare, but you know, of people dropping dead of heart attacks that you would assume were fit, as, as you say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, one thing that I, uh, I guess, I'd love to uh, impress on your on your listeners is something to keep in mind when you see these kind of confused stories about ostensibly healthy people just suddenly dying right what you should know yeah you have to know that nature does not make mistakes okay the the, the, mother nature the universe works on a principle of absolute unchangeable immutable laws that that they, they they do not waver okay they always work in the exact same way at all times if it weren't the case then you would see we would have a universe of absolute chaos. My, my hand could just turn into a, a brick and then, and then my face turn into a, into a snake it's just like uh, for no reason, right? No, the universe works on strict order, okay? Strict, strict order. It, nothing happens for no reason. There is no such thing, no such thing as effect without cause. Absolutely not. If the conditions for health are satisfied, 
the effect of cancer cannot, cannot occur. If the conditions for health are satisfied, the effect of heart disease cannot occur. Okay, so what becomes the question is what determines health? What are the natural laws that govern the state of health so as to give the effect of the absence of disease from disease, you know, health vitality? Well, and what are the things that cause sickness and disease? So it's understanding nature and understanding these laws that becomes important. It's when we live in such a way where we do not understand these laws and then we get the effect of sickness and disease that we have confusion, okay? And, and that, is the, that is the problem. So, and in culture, as, as it's been constructed now, where we have, you know, the food industry and we have marketing and we have foods that are given to us, but only because they're marketable and, you know, at the expense of health, we have these things that kind of erode our bodies over time, that leave metabolic waste products over time, that aren't compatible with human physiology, but are tasty, <laughs> um, you know, in, in a fake way. We can get into that later. All of these things contribute to the blockages and encumbrances that get lodged in the tissues and cause disease over time. And so when we're eating this way, we can still be nice and fit. We can still start do chin-ups every single day at the gym and our muscles swell and get big and strong. But if you're taking into your body that which was never supposed to be there, you're going to have problems. Okay. And so, yes, it's, 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 uh, it's always a bit of a confusing thing when we see someone who's healthy on the outside die uh, but it wasn't a, it wasn't chance there's was no such thing as random it was something that was in the works for a long time so what are some of these immutable laws of health that you speak of right so i'd say the most applicable one would be cause and effect okay um, you can, if your if your listeners want to take a look um, at the Hermetic principles. So these have been in in the ancient in ancient knowledge, occult wisdom, passed down from generation upon generation, way in human history. These were recognized long, long, long time ago. And so the Hermetic laws are something that you can that you can take a look at, investigate, and you'll you'll get a um, you get a, a, a list of these natural laws. Um, mentality. Okay, so one of the laws being mentality where in order for something to come into existence, it needs to exist in a, in a higher realm first, in, a, in the thought realm first. There are no exceptions to this. Uh, trees, rocks, clouds, stars, galaxies, um, they all exist before coming into physical manifestation in some sort of higher thought realm or some sort of higher realm first and then trickles down into creation. So, I mean, in terms of um, human, human life, so let's bring it back down to earth. Uh, look around you, look around you and look at everything that man has created. Every single thing without question had to exist as a thought first before it was created. Mm. No exceptions whatsoever, right? And, you know, you, you think about it, you dwell on it, you meditate on it, and you realize, okay, no, this is true. Right. There, there is nothing that we can create that, that cannot exist up here in mind first. Right. Okay. That's, that is an example of one of these immutable, unchangeable laws. Okay. And there are many. Um, rhythm, polarity. Uh, everything has its particular polarity. From every cell, every, you know, every molecule, everything has a negative, negative, not negative in the sense of bad, but just a polarized thing. Right. Negative, it's positive polarity. And it's the dance and it's the interplay of these two polarities that give um, the spark of life. Okay. So this law of polarity is extant in every single fabric of reality without question, immutable law. Okay. Um, so the seasons, okay, winter, summer, you know, the interplay of the seasons. Um, menstrual cycles, uh, the, the wake sleep cycle, all of it, this, this kind of dualistic energy where you have this, um, you know, these opposite poles and then everything in between. So yeah. the things you eat can influence these, these laws? 
Was that kind of the point no, behind it? No, like, no. Go ahead. Yeah, no, nothing, nothing that we can do can uh, influence or change these laws. No, that's but, not what it, Okay, well, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's um, what we have control over is the degree to which those laws uh, affect our lives. Right, right? and that's so, what I was getting at. Yeah. So if you let, you take the force of gravity, for example, on, on planet Earth, we have this uh, phenomenon of gravity, okay? And when we have a hot air balloon, for example, we can, we can manipulate uh, these, these, these physical laws and we can create an air balloon to float up into the, into the sky. And it's amazing. Like, oh my God, we're flying, okay, in this hot air balloon. But has the force of gravity changed? Has, has the, have, have you changed the law of gravity by floating around in this air balloon? The answer is no, of course not. But what you have done is you've just changed the way that the gravitational force is working in the mechanics of the air balloon. But the actual underlying force is constant. It's, it's just, you know. Great example. It's just that you manipulate the, the law to work for you. Okay. So it's understanding how the law works. And then with our behavior, we can set up conditions through which... The law works in our favor to give us a desired result, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, that's a great clarification. Okay. Clarification. One thing I wanted to ask you about this. Mm -hmm. Let's just. This is. Uh, you know, I'm sure you get this all the time. But B12, for example, do you take B12 yeah. supplements? Yeah. Is this something no, you take on this diet? Okay. So, why is it that whenever you hear, uh, be it nutritionists, almost anybody mm -hmm. you know and my my wife for instance she is doing a parenting podcast and on there she's been interviewing experts on nutrition like right. in infants and children and all this stuff and i remember like they she just spoke to uh, a couple plant-based uh, pediatricians recently and they were saying even mentioned b12 b12 supplements and stuff like that if you're abstaining fully from meat so what's your take right. on this right right so B12 is naturally produced in the human body, okay? Your gut produces B12, your, uh, you produce B12 in your mouth. Uh, you, you, you produce all the B12 that you, that you, can, that you could ever want, okay? So it's, it's a bacterial product. You find B12 in soil as well. It's an organic, an organic bacteria that produces this B12, okay? So the question becomes not how much B12 are you taking into your body, but why can your body not use the B12 that it endogenously produces? That becomes the question. And the reason that most people are not absorbing the B12 that they do produce is because of the internal toxicity and the toxicity of the foods that they habitually take into the body that compromises the body's ability to use its own its own resources okay so the problem in the nutritional field is that because everybody eats in the way that is conventional in terms of what's you know the culturally conventional foods right so indiscriminately eating everything right, right. Um, most of it being what the human body again was not designed to take in okay even things that we think are relative, conventionally healthy, right? Not necessarily suited for, hu for human physiology in terms of our biological endowments and whatnot, like we spoke about earlier. So the more of these things that we take in, the more compromised tissues are and the less sensitive our tissues become in being able to use the B12 that we do produce. So... Um, and I, this, when I did blood tests, um, uh, I think what, like three years, three years into my fruitarian type of lifestyle and, uh, you know, blood tests came back and B12 was perfectly normal, perfectly normal B12, uh, levels, even though I have, I, uh, I've never taken a B12 supplement. I think I might've done one just as an experiment, like 10 years ago or so, right. uh, you know, I've never taken B12 supplements. Okay. For any for any reasonable length of time. And, um, you know, I've been, I've been vegan for I, I, about 10 years now. 
So no animal products for way longer than I've been fruitarian. My B12 is fine. Um, you, what, 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 what you have to do is you have to let your body uh, get cleaned out enough so that it has the sensitivity to be able to use what it produces internally. That's, that's why you don't need B12 supplements. Um, when you have, for, mo for the majority of people who are eating conventionally, who might have a B12 deficiency, yeah. And it's not a meat thing. You, you can have, um, you can, uh, meat eaters have B12 deficiencies, in fact, more so than, than vegans and vegetarians, because it's not, um, it's not how much bulk you can put into your, into your mouth. It's how cleanly the, the system is working on the inside that determines um, how much you're able to use. So, so that goes that, back. That's that's my. Yeah, no, that yeah, makes sorry, sense. So, no, it just goes back to the whole idea of these toxins being trapped inside your cells and muscle tissues. Like this is just like right. a further problem that that causes. Another thing I wanted to ask just, you about. Yeah. It, go ahead. No, no, no. That, that's right. Yeah. Um, I was. I guess I was just going to add that. You know, it's funny these these individual types of uh, nutrients that we kind of that we kind of obsess over. Uh, it's it's a curious thing that out of twenty seven, twenty eight million odd species of of life on planet Earth, not a single one of them has to worry about diet in the way that humans do. Not a single one of them. They all seem to come programmed with this exceptional ability to just know innately what their diet is and what isn't. And they stick to that from the day they're born to the day they die. And they never have these types of insane uh, problems that we do. But it's only humans that are so confused as to what we eat, where we, we, we tend to obsess over all these different types of microscopic nutrients that need to come into the diet at the same time. And if we don't, but why? But you really got to stop and ask why. Why do we have to have this type of intellectual uh, stress associated with eating when these apparently dumber species never think about this stuff and they're perfectly healthy, right? Is it, is it possible? Because they simply. Yeah. Is it possible that humans are, are focused on trying to maximize their health and they think that somehow, or we think that somehow we can sort of manipulate our nutritional intake to maximize like the efficiency of our bodies and longevity? Yeah. Yes. Um, it's because with our with our amazing ability to kind of um, to examine to examine the world we live in, uh, we we obviously of course everybody wants health. Every right. every organ we all want health, right? So it's natural to to examine the world and um, and explore and and try to figure out what is it that causes that creates health. So in so doing, we've we've gone into the microscopic world and we've we've examined the components and elements that make up food but in so doing we've obsessed over the components that make up food and we've lost sight of what food is in general so instead of instead of worrying eating food we've obsessed about eating nutrients and that is one of the fun the fun fundamental stumbling blocks that has that has plagued humanity for a long time since, uh, you know, since the you know, industrial revolutions since modern times, since we were able to do all of these kind of in-depth examinations and food. So now in the pursuit of health, let's say we, okay, so we discover, oh, hey, there are these things called uh, proteins and we notice that they are in the food that we eat. We also notice that our human body is made up of many proteins. Therefore, we have to eat as much protein as possible because we notice it in our body. Okay, so you go down this path, this this rationalization path of eating, pro and all the while you forget what food is uh, designed for your system, and you start paying attention to all the sources of protein out in the world, and it doesn't even matter what the source is, as long as it has protein, it must be good. Because protein is in our body, so I'll give you an example. Um, I can take a I can take a uh, a table that's made of wood, just a, just a straight table made of wood, and I can point to 
fiber, minerals, and all sorts of all sorts of amazing nutrients that are that the table is made out of. But you would never eat the table for just because it has fiber and minerals in it, right? But it's that thinking, it's that same type of thinking that we're really crippled by because it's not the presence of nutrients in a thing that denotes whether it's food. It's whether it's biologically accessible to you that determines whether it's food or not, okay? So it's this obsession with nutrients where we lose sight of what is food for the species that has caused the problems. So this whole idea that you need X amount of protein and carbohydrates, it's all a farce in your view. It's, it's, no, it's, not, it's not a farce. It's just that the, the concentrations and the, the excessive concentrations of these things is, is uh, misleading. Okay, it's not what the health community says you need. Uh, you do not need to eat concentrated, dense concentrated proteins in your diet every single day, you know, in order to have health, in order to have protein in your body. The, the, the amount, the protein requirements in the body are so minimal, are so incredibly minimal. That Okay, let's just put it this way. If you eat, period, <laughs> if, you are, if you are an eater of food, as a human being, you are getting enough protein. Uh, it's, just, it's that simple. You cannot avoid getting protein. I don't care what you eat. Well, okay, if you eat processed sugar only, maybe you're not getting protein. So, like in your in your, <laughs> but if you eat anything, you like your blue. Yeah. If you ate only blueberries and then yeah. like strawberries later in the day, that would be fine. Yeah. Really. You'd be fine. Wow. Yes. You, can, you cannot, in, in, in the organic world of, of fruits and vegetables that the planet uh, creates and provides, right. protein is in everything. It is in absolutely everything. You cannot avoid this. You cannot eat things that grow from the earth and not be getting protein. All right? It's just, so it's in everything. Um, so you can't avoid it. And the smaller concentrations of amino acids and proteins that you find in like what you said blueberries and strawberries it's just not the sheer density of proteins and amino acids that you'd find in something like steak or cheese or meat or whatnot but it's not that the body needs those dense concentrations it only needs the small amount of amino acids right uh so it's we almost use this uh, protein obsession to to justify uh, an, an animal agriculture industry. Mm. It's like you know they have to have something that they're giving you that you can't that you can't get from just your natural diet. So it, it helps to it helps to rationalize the existence of a very very profitable industry. Um, no, you do not. You don't. You do not. You need protein. Or you need amino acids, I should say. I should make a distinction between protein and amino acids. Um, you've never been able to use a protein in your entire life, a, a foodborne protein. Right. No human being has ever used an exact protein. Your body needs to labor to separate these proteins into an individual amino acids and then use those. Okay. So um, taking protein, complex protein structures into your body, you can still use them. But you might as well get them from a simpler source like a blueberry that has amino acids whereby you don't need the extra digestive burden of breaking them apart first, reconstructing them into your own human proteins, and then absorbing them. So doing that is, is a, a lot more taxing on your vital reserves than to simply eat the blueberry or the strawberry and get the amino acids in their raw form. And then you just assemble them. So you save half the digestive effort. Um, I'll, uh, just a very simple analogy. If I, if I wanted you to build me a house, for example, and I said, okay, I want you to build me a house, um, what would you rather I do? Give you the raw materials or point you in the direction of some house that's already assembled and say, break down that house first into all of its original, you know, parts, the sure. planks, of, and then reconstruct it. There's no way you'd want me to give you the raw materials, and then you just build the house from scratch. So is this part Think of, of it like that? Is this part of why you need less um, 
energy from calories? Because you had mentioned that you eat blueberries and I think you said uh, cantaloupes, just for argument's sake, later in the day. Sure. Um, sure. That, yeah. you know, by any metric that we'd be used to thinking about would be a super low caloric intake for the day, right? Yes. Is, is part of the reason why you can operate on such few or on so few cal- calories rather because your body's doing less of that work breaking things down and separating them or do we have an entire misconception as well as how many calories we actually eat and where we get our energy from right uh you, you uh you got it this uh, is actually really well said um yes you we actually don't need as 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 much caloric intake as we're as we're told yes um now, why is it that I'm able to uh, get around or get by with uh, with less? It's because through the systematic detoxing that this type of diet and lifestyle irrevocably gives you, again, you you cleanse the tissues out of all of all the riffraff, and you liberate you start to liberate energy channels that were more sluggish and dormant before. So. What happens is your efficiency, your, the efficiency with which your body operates in order to get access to food, it, sc- it starts to go way, way up. So you can eat an apple and get twice the amount of energy from the apple as you would if, you're, if your body was weighed down and encumbered by all the other things and you're only getting a little bit, right? Mm. So your absorption and your, your uh, utilization and your efficiency, they just go way, way, way up. So now your body is better able to get more from less. I'll give you an example. Um, just just now, like right now, uh, I I went through the last five days, and in five days I had one watermelon, and that was it. And I was perfectly energetic, um, you know, working out all day. Uh, I went to work uh, on sets, doing whatever I needed to do at work. And so two in, so I fasted for two days. I broke a fast with, with a watermelon, one whole watermelon, and just ate that throughout the day. And then the next three days, I didn't eat anything. And, you know, I was bouncing off the walls with energy of dancing, uh, did some dancing lessons, uh, did, you know, did my regular routine of push-ups, handstands, um, uh, you know, whatever. And you're never and hungry like, during this? Like during this uh, time frame, you're not like sitting there thinking, oh, my God, I'm hungry. No. Yeah, no. Uh, you, you, it's like, remember I was saying earlier, you have this kind of calm that comes over. Yes. It, imagine, imagine if you could, if you could translate the calm that you'd have in, you know, a deep meditation and translate that type of calm to what's happening in your, in your digestive system, in your body. You, you, it's just this peace. It's just this calm. So you, you're not getting these, oh, these, these, these pains of hunger. You're not getting anything like that. And um, you could eat something, but you don't need anything. It's just this, this amazing state of not needing. And um, you, you do start to experience that when you're in a fasted state when the body is, is, uh, is cleaner. Whereas, you know, several, several years ago, if I were to go for whatever, uh, several hours without eating, you might start getting these hunger pangs and whatnot. I, I don't experience hunger like I like I used to. And and for anybody that does, you know, start to clean up the diet, you, you will you will start to experience hunger in a different way. It's not the aggressive like um, uh, nagging type of thing. Right. It's like I need a whole pizza more- right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, so I kind of want to um, switch switch gears here. Um, so, you know, we started off. You're you're kind of talking about the things you can do with your mind through meditation, but in order yeah. to really be able to do that, you need to clean up your diet, and you need to ensure that these toxins that fit inside your your uh, muscle tissues and cellular structures are expunged, right? So. Having yes. said all that, like when you get to that point, what are some of the things that you can do with your mind? And particularly, I'm interested in this um, idea of astral projection and lucid dreaming. Like one, what are yeah. both of those? Are they the same or how are they different? Like maybe let's start there. Sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so they, they are related. 
they're, they're very, very closely related, actually. Um, slightly different, though. So when you're, let's take lucid dreaming, for example, um, you, you dream every single night, right? It, the difference between a dream that you remember and one that you don't is just how, how conscious, how present you are and how active you are in the dream state. So every night you dream and what's happening is you have, we have a physical body, but there are other bodies that make up you as a human being other than just your physical body. So you have a physical body. You also have an etheric body. Etheric meaning the next, uh, the next gradation in vibrational state above physical. Okay. So you have an etheric body. You also, uh, you have to remember, um, there's a, there's an energy spectrum. Okay. And visible light, the, the universe that we operate in, it's just a very tiny, tiny uh, fraction of the energetic um, spectrum. Okay, anybody can Google this uh, for your, your audience. You know, just go and, and look up the vis, vis, visible spectrum of light. Okay, in the energy spectrum, you'll see it's it's just this tiny fraction. Okay, so we operate in an energetic context, and so your body, the physical body is again part of that and this physical world is part of that uh, band of frequency but there are other frequencies above it you know a dog whistle you blow a dog whistle you don't hear it very well dogs do right? it's just it's because the sound is operating on a different frequency that we don't have access to as readily internet radio these are all these, these things all exist it's just frequency levels above what we can detect right so so this isn't woo woo and you know this is just very very scientific so, that being said, sorry, I wanted to preface this a little bit so that, uh, you know, people aren't, get, aren't getting lost. So, we have this physical body, and we have an etheric body, we have an astral body, which is, again, finer and finer vibrational levels above that. And we have emotional bodies, mental bodies, okay, so on and on it goes. When we're dreaming, what's happening is the astral body is... Um, liberated from the physical body so that it can go into the higher planes and I'm just going to say to simplify recharge okay from the energetic um, uh, atmosphere recharge and then reconnect with the physical body when you wake up so that you have energy to go on about your day okay so it's it's <laughs> If you want to use a battery as a, as a kind of this um, a, an analogy, you could do that. It's it's really no different. Your astral body is like this battery, whereby at at nighttime it goes to recharge and then it comes back. And lucid dreaming would entail your. Uh, I'm just trying. I really want to make this as as easy to understand as possible. Um. Your consciousness is an, is you, okay? And as consciousness, your consciousness can enter, uh, can reside in the physical body, and it can also reside in the astral body. When you're sleeping and your astral body separates in, in the state of sleep, if your consciousness uh, resides in the, in the astral body, you will have control of your astral body and be able to lucid dream and astral project um, like we're talking about. If, if your consciousness is not as firmly affixed to your astral body as it is left right when you're in the sleep state, you will not be having these lucid dreams and astral astral experiences. Um, if you, as an analogy, so, so it's easy to con kind of conceptualize in, in the mind, um, if I jump into a car, I can drive the car, I can do whatever, I can manipulate the car. Um, me being a, a representation of, the, of consciousness, okay? So pretend I am a, I'm consciousness, I jump into a car, I drive around, I do what I need to do, I leave the car, I jump into a tractor, I do everything I need to do with the tractor, I, I just do work, okay? I leave the tractor, okay? The car and the tractor are vehicles, Without the conscious entity guiding them, they do nothing. They, 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 you can't do anything with them. 
right? It requires a conscious entity in them in order to to do work. Think of your 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 bodies like that. Your physical your physical body. If you're not conscious, if you if someone just comes and punches me in the face and I'm unconscious, I'm no longer operating my physical body. Right. So you, you see what I mean. So what determines whether you're able to? And I'll define astral projection and lucid dreaming as well. So what determines whether you uh, you are doing these things? is the degree to, w- to which your consciousness is present in those bodies when you're in the, s- the sleep state, okay? So, that being said, a lucid dream is when you are in the dream world, in the dream state, and you, you are consciously present in the dream, and you are, you are aware that you are, in fact, dreaming. So the dream world that you see around you in, in, in a dream you know that you're dreaming and you can you, the world responds to your thoughts in the dream state because you're conscious so i want to see a, a, a mermaid with wings fly by in the dream state because i know i'm dreaming all i do is i think it and there there you have it the mermaid with wings flows by and i say holy smokes this is amazing i want to fly uh you fly around you do you do you, you you have immense powers i'm just very very briefly generalizing when you're astral projecting Okay, it's similar, but in an astral projection, the direct astral projection from uh, from you just lying down in your bed, you are conscious of the entire journey from the beginning. So you're, you sense or are able to detect and are aware of your astral body leaving your physical, and you you are able to explore the physical world in an astral body as an as an outlooker so what um if i yeah so if i'm astral if i do an astral projection from my bed okay so i lie down on my bed right now and i astral project my consciousness would leave my physical body go into my astral body and i would be able to observe the room the very room that i'm sleeping in quote unquote sleeping in and observe my body lying there, my physical body lying there, not moving. I'd be able to look over to my room and see my lamp on my bed, see it, look out my own window, look at look at my TV, look at, go through my door. The difference is I'm I'm accessing the same physical world that we're in right now, except in a non-physical body. And in that state, you have an immense degree of freedoms. You can travel anywhere you want on planet Earth. You can go into the atmosphere, into the solar system. You can visit the sun, something that I've done. Um, you can visit uh, friends, spy on them. It's, Come it's an on. Awful way to, so this is like an out-of-body um, experience, like when people say they have an, this. So yes. when, when people say they have an out-of-body experience, is that what that is then? Like they're in the astral yeah. form, I guess? Yeah, yeah. For the sake of simplicity, I will say, yeah, that's exactly what it is. Um, people who have near-death experiences will will, will have this. Um, people that are sick, very sick, sometimes have out-of-body experiences, which just yeah, which exactly means that their astral body has separated, their consciousness has gone into the astral, and as such, just like the man driving the car, the woman driving the car, they have entered into a new vehicle with which they can express their consciousness. So that's what's happening with the astral experience, is your consciousness has now jumped into a new vehicle and is able to express consciousness in that vehicle. So um, when, as I was saying, uh, you know, if I'm in my room, in my astral body, and I'm looking around, I'm still intact. I'm still Eli. I'm still, I still have a complete awareness of everything that I've done in my life, all my friends, family. Nothing's changed. You're there. But your physical body is somewhere else. So it's this real mind job. It's like, it makes you think, oh my God, what exactly am I? What is this? What is life? If I'm me and I'm staring at my own body way over there in the corner, just ah, sleeping, it's just, it, it, it's, it's this amazing revelation of how grand you actually are. So right? can you, you see yourself? Like what, if you were to, so, yeah. can, can you look at your astral self, like either in the mirror or look down at your hand? 
Um, usually what happens if you do look in a mirror when you're, when you're astral traveling is you'll either see nothing because it's not a physical entity, right? That, is, that would be reflected in right. the physical mirror that you're looking at. Um, or you would, you would be creating something to, to see, but that's, but that would be <laughs> just so of your crazy. own creation, right? It's, I, I, yeah, it's, it's very, it's very trippy. I've, I've done it before. I've, I've been, I stared at my own mirror in, many times. In, How in many times have you done state. this? Like, is this oh, something you can times. do on command, like almost on command? Like if you wanted to have the experience? Um, I can lucid dream m with more consistency than I can astral project. Um, it's no, it's not a consistent thing that I can do on demand every time. However, if I, if I determine that I want to do it, usually what happens is I can get a, a lucid dream state very, very often, almost all the time. And from the lucid dream state, you can, you can astral project. So you can use that, you can use that lucid dream state to start astral projecting. And that's a, for beginners like myself, right? I, cons I consider myself a beginner. That's an easier way to go about it than rather than the direct astral right from lying down um uh so i'm yes i've gotten fairly good at being able to induce that when i when i want yes um and i've had many many astral experiences um and each one of them is is like the most fantastic thing you'll ever do in life <laughs> so just, you can go anywhere you can go anywhere you want in the universe like you could you know, come here where I am right now and I wouldn't be able to see you, but you could sit on this couch across from me and just be like, what's this guy up to? You know, or, and then from that moment you could decide, I'm going to go check out like uh, Proxima Centauri and like go to another galaxy or something. If, if that is insane. Yes. Okay. So how Correct. does one do this? You know, and maybe since you, let's go lucid dreaming first. Since that day, sure. you said that sure. might be a bit easier, and then maybe from there you can talk about astral projection because this is absolutely yeah, fascinating. No, no problem. Um, if your if your listeners are interested, um, there's a book by uh, Robert Monroe, who was one of the one of the pioneers of uh, you know of putting into the culture what what astral projection was when it wasn't really understood. So um, you can you can do some further reading on this, and it's amazing. They did you know. Uh, laboratory experiments and sleep sleep labs and whatnot. So they studied this. They they get them in a lab. Say, okay, you're gonna astral project. Tell us what's in the next room. Type of deal. So like very very scientific. So again, for your audience, this is not woo woo. This is not new age mumbo jumbo. This is this is spiritual science that we're dealing with. Right? These are tangible, concrete things that we're dealing with here. Um, so how can you do this? Tonight, how can you do this as fast as possible? What 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 can you do to, to experience these states? So, first thing I would say is, like we were talking about earlier, have as undisturbed a sleep as possible. So, eat early in the day, um, you know, have your dinner earlier on, uh, and have a very, very peaceful sleep. So, nothing being digested in your sleep. Just go to bed like, like normal. And if you can set an alarm or if you do wake up earlier, then that turns into the best time to do an astral projection or a lucid dream. So, um, and I put a video out on this on my channel recently, but I'll, but I'll, um, I'll go through some of these steps here with you guys today. And I'll link all your, um, your videos in the show notes after, so oh, people cool. can check them okay. out. So, Yeah, thank you. No problem. Yeah. So, the thing you'd want to do is you'd want to be well rested because if you try to do this, um, and you can be successful with it any at any time, but generally when you do this at the end of the day, you're so tired that the the natural inclination will be just to sleep like like normal, and you'll just fall asleep when you're trying to to do this. So um, the best thing to do is to be a bit rested so that you're not so that you're not super tired. Mm -hmm but you still can get some, you know, some sleep. And it's that kind of in and out or half in, half out state that's best for, for this type of thing. So you go to bed and you get good sleep. In the morning when you wake up, you know, you can get up, mill around for a little bit, um, go to the washroom, whatever, and then just go back to sleep or, or lie down again. And now when you lie down again and you're, you're kind of groggy or, you know, you've just woken up, that that's the best place to be in to start astral projecting 
And then what you do is you would just be very mindful, right? So just be very mindful of what comes into into your thought process while you're lying down, okay? So you're you're trying to keep your mind awake while letting your body relax completely and fall asleep. You, when I say fall asleep, I mean you are trying to you are trying to be consciously mindful of the process that happens all the time except this time you're going to be aware of you of the sleep um the sleep progressions okay so to do that we keep our mind engaged so you lie down your body is nice and relaxed make sure you're relaxed deep breaths in deep breaths out release any tension and you start to be mindful of any thoughts that that linger in your in your mind and as you do that just keep you know keep a record you know just just recognize oh you know there's a goat jumping over a, a fence okay great that's that's one little thought that passed by oh i just thought of my mom oh i just thought of uh of this bowling session i had and just just be mindful eventually what happens if you're not moving okay you can't move uh you have to your body has to be still perfectly still in any position that's comfortable so what happens eventually is if you stay mindful and your mind is still engaged what happens is the thoughts that come into your mind they start to become more and more and more colorful and vivid so it so it's almost like you can actually start seeing what's happening right instead of just thinking them and at some point the vividness will really start to come to life okay so you you if you're completely still the vividness starts to to really 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 come to life and when that happens you're very very close all that you need to do then is hold that vivid image in mind whatever comes about maybe you're in a pasture somewhere uh that that's what comes to mind and you just stick with that and if you've done it right the world will start to materialize and materialize and then all of a sudden you'll realize that you're in the dream state you're on that plane that pasture except now you're conscious now you know that you're dreaming and and all of a sudden you have these amazing abilities and uh powers to do work in the dream state so you're capitalizing and exploiting this higher realm of of um of existence with and, and you're able to use it consciously to do things you can you can solve problems in your daily life by asking questions of your higher self you can there's so many things you can do um like what else when um one thing you can do is you can uh you can speak to past loved ones you can act, because your 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 mind again works on a very similar in, in a very similar way there are there are higher levels of uh how do i want to say this you have a higher self that is connected to a higher degree of intelligence. So that same that same ineffable intelligence that I was talking about earlier that that knows how to repair your arm, okay? That's a very very high level type of natural intelligence that that powers the operation of things in the world. As you move up these vibrational scales, you you start to have closer and come in closer and closer contact with these types of intelligence. Uh intelligences, excuse me. And when you're in the out of body state, you you have access to um to these to this type of intelligence that that is part of your own mind, that is part of your own body. And so you can ask things of yourself. So let, okay, I'll give you an example. Let's just say I want to uh, I have a business decision to make and I don't know I don't know what what I want to do. Do I want to buy or do I want to sell? Okay? So, I jump I decide that day okay I'm going to ask my higher self I'm going to I'm going to go into the sleep state and gain access to the higher components of my mind. So I go into this lucid dream and I'm I I'm, I I I I I'm in I'm in that that pasture, okay? Uh like like the example we gave, I say great, okay great, I'm in the lucid dream state. I'm, you know, I'm here. Now I want to have my question answered. So maybe I would say I would just call up a a a computer screen I would just find a computer screen in my in my lucid dream and I would say okay computer I want you to show me um 
show me what happens if I decide to buy and the computer screen might show me something. Okay, what happens if I decide to sell? It might show me something. Um, and then I say, okay, um, what if I invest this amount of money? What would happen? And the computer screen might show you something. Okay, it, it's literally like that. It doesn't have to be a computer screen. It could be anything. Let's say, let's say in the lucid dream state, you simply, the way that makes sense to you to gain information is to have some, some guru, some entity, some being come and, and talk to you. You could just say, all right, come, uh, come, come talk to me, come give me some help. And I don't know, it, it could be a rabbit that pops out of nowhere. It could be a person. It could be a talking car, whatever, whatever your mind creates. And then you could, it, it would be able to give you information and so then you'd make sense of it. Are you accessing like different dimensions mm. of reality through doing this? Is that kind of what you're doing? And yes. So I'm sure you've read up on or know about like people who have these psychedelic experiences like these either yeah. like in the the shamanistic is it ayahuasca that, that they use like mm -hmm. those sorts of experiences or people mm -hmm. who do it through like um, psilocybin or dmt and stuff like that i heard right. someone once say that this is like a what that is is a hack mm -hmm. a way that people can can access that and say hey if you or able to calm your mind, get yourself into this state. Um, this is what you could potentially access, right? And I remember reading that um, the use of psychedelics was something that was widespread in the ancient world. Like I believe in, in the, the paganistic culture, there used to be a pilgrimage that people would go on. I know Socrates and Plato um, went on this. I can't remember. I think Plato even wrote about it where I know Marcus Aurelius also went on this journey where you wouldn't go as a youth or anything like that. It's like you would prepare your whole life, have this one journey, drink this stuff. I can't really remember what it's called, but you would come back and you wouldn't be afraid of death, essentially, right? And like right. They, they would say you would go into this other realm and you would you know be with the gods. And you know, I also remember hearing about this um, experiment done by a psychologist where they had a bunch of different patients, right? There, were, there was control groups for the patients. Like, you couldn't be new to uh, psychedelic drugs, but you couldn't be an addict. But you definitely, you couldn't be a rookie okay. either, right? No one could speak to each other, right? And they would be given psilocybin drips through intravenous. He shut mm -hmm. down the experiment mm -hmm. because every single one of them reported back that they got shot out of their body and went into this different realm and they met these entities, okay that were like surprised to see right. them or happy that they finally uncovered this technology. And this guy was a, a Christian, I believe. I might have this story somewhat wrong, but he shut it down. He freaked out. So is this kind of like, are you accessing mm. the same thing? Yes. It, it, yeah, to put it simply, yes. W what you are doing is you are, you are simply accessing a level of reality that your physical body is not as closely attuned to in in the exact same way as um, us speaking right now on this uh, on our computers okay we our computers have the ability to access the information that is everywhere called you know called the internet right but we in our if we didn't have our computers our physical bodies don't have access to this internet reality but we, so we have this tool that gives us access to that. So it is information. It's it, it's a type of it's a type of reality. It's just not the one that aligns with physical reality. So when um, you do either astral projection or lucid dreaming, or if you take compounds, either organic natural compounds or not, or synthetic, more pharmaceutical grade, which are still sourced from plants anyway right whether you do it that way either way what's happening is you are you are manipulating your your state your 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 conscious state to be able to access these other realities or vibrational levels you can understand it either way so yes yeah you're correct yeah that's that is what's happening and um just like there is we have life on physical uh, on, on the planet in the physical reality there is also life on other realities on higher levels and lower levels okay so life is everywhere and there are entities that do reside in this state so 
I, I mentioned earlier that you could speak to past loved ones, um, and that's that's what I'm referring to. Uh, when you when you pass away, there's part of you that resides in this in in that state, and so speaking to someone who's passed away, you know, recently, um, it would be no different than you and I are speaking right now. If you want to speak to someone who's passed away, it's like, okay, well, I got to jump in my vehicle that allows me access to that, and then I can speak to them, right? You want to, you want to, I want to swim with sharks? I can't do that with my physical body. What do I do? I jump into a vehicle. I jump into my scuba suit, and now I have access to the underwater environment that I did not have access to in my physical body. Same thing. So what do you think consciousness is then? Ooh. Ooh, if anyone can give a perfect definition of that, I would be very impressed. <laughs> I don't think um, anyone it can. Is, <laughs> think What's it to you? Can. It, oh, oh my God. You must have thought. It, so. Yeah, that, yeah. That, um, consciousness, oh my God. You, there's so, it's so, so vast. It's such a vast thing. And so, it, okay. it, it covers let, so many bases. Let me try and rephrase this then, like to fit yeah, the context yeah. of this conversation. Do you think our bodies are yeah. acting as antennas projecting consciousness and consciousness can float between these realms so therefore when our physical body dies consciousness leaves yeah. and ends up in these other realms or is it something that like you know once the tv goes out that's it like the signal's gone forever right right yeah so uh that's that's actually great that you brought that up um yeah i would say your your conscious your consciousness okay is you is is uh, the expression of life is the manifestation of life, okay, and life consciousness is what is trying to do is it's trying to trying to find expression in different vehicles, and in your physical body, right, it has a certain amount of um, potential for expression available to it. In a different body, it has other means of expression available to it in that body. But it's that same consciousness that is using each of these bodies um, in order to develop and grow in spiritual evolution. Okay, So, um, like you said, when the TV goes out, TV goes out. But that doesn't mean that the, uh, the network broadcasting the signal has died that the, the 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 signal is still there but the tv has simply stopped decoding that vibrational uh information so your body what your physical body is is it, it is a decoder of information your physical body decodes the 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 information of the world around us and it allows us to interpret that information so that we can categorize it and codify it in a certain way that makes sense in a linear experience so that our consciousness learns about this experience so it's a decoder of information then you jump into that astral body that i was talking about earlier, and then in deeper states you know the the adepts of old the ancient masters they 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 drop their consciousness into higher bodies the mental body right and the thought body these are much higher and and infinitely more complex but um yes you have access now to those bodies and those bodies on their own respective planes are decoders of information on that plane right so all of these all of these um frequency bands they, they're all around us all, all at the same time it's just that we're not decoding the information when we don't have the right body just, just like the radio frequency has to be dialed to the right frequency in order to decode that informational thing, right? So we're, we're, we're simply just flipping, flipping the switch. So the death of the, the body in this um, reality isn't necessarily tied yes. to the death of the body in the astral reality. Like the, that reality can still decode the information in its own reality, for, if that makes sense. That's how I think that's what you're getting at. Absolutely. That's what I'm getting at. Yes, that is correct. Yes. Um, d death, death and rebirth. Oh, no, no. I should say this. Immortality, okay, 
immortality is nothing but a good memory, a very, a very good memory. What I mean by that is, this is this was an ancient understanding, is that the, the transcending of death, okay, um, it didn't necessarily mean that you uh, your physical body never dies, but what they did was they transcended the forgetfulness between incarnations of physical bodies. So that that higher aspect of yourself, no, that that can never die. It does not die, right? It's simply the the medium in which your consciousness resides in the interim period before it decides to take on another experience. But becoming immortal means that you just never forget. So if you if I if, if I if I was aware of all my past lives, would death really frighten me? Probably not. Right, you would you would be immortal because you you always remember, and that's and that's what what um, what the ancients were referring to when they talked about immortality. Um, uh, it as as an as an analogy. Um, in the winter time, the trees. To our to our per, uh, perception, they they die. Okay, they symbolically die. But do they really die? They change state. Right? They go into a dormancy mode, they sleep, and in the springtime, they seem to come back to life. It's not that the tree has died, okay, but it has undergone a change of state. It doesn't really die. And then in the springtime, you know, everything comes back to life and it blooms and, and it has its life. And then in the winter, it quote-unquote dies, and the cycle re goes on and on and on and on and on. The energy that powers these systems, they never die, they don't go anywhere. It's just a change of state. And that's, 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 that's really, it's a, it is as simple as that. As complex as we can get, you know, we can, we can make things. It's really, it really is that simple. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. You know? Is there, are there people who claim to remember all of their past lives? Like anybody that you've read? Yes, there, there, there have been uh, many, many documented incidences like this. There was a, uh, a case a while ago of a, of a, of a kid who remembered their, their past life. They were, they were killed. I think they were, they were killed violently or, or killed unexpectedly in, you know, in one life. And uh, sometimes when that happens, when the, when the conscious entity, um, it's it's terminated too early there can be a tendency for it to want to uh remember or or wants to incarnate again really quickly because it, it wasn't satisfied with the with the short life um it's 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 a funny thing how it works but anyway i remember this this story and um the 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 entity had reincarnated and as a child the, the the kid had had this uh, just had this memory, had this memory of something that happened before. Like it, it had this unshakable feeling that me, this this person that I am, I, I feel like I I um, I did, did things right. It it, I, it was just aware. It was just aware of these experiences and memories that didn't make sense because it the kid hadn't experienced them in that current life. And so uh, the authorities got involved, you know, the, the kid told his parents and said, yeah, no, I, I, I died. I remember dying. I remember dying here in this particular situation in that place. There was an investigation. The authorities got involved and they discovered that they checked the records. They're like, holy, holy crap, there was someone who died here uh, many, many years ago in the, exactly the same way as this child is, is recounting. And it was just that they, they had come back into a different body, different parents, different everything, and remember, right? Um, and, and this isn't a one-off thing. This has happened many, many times. My mind is blown. What Are there people who can consciously remember, like masters or gurus or any of these people who are really into this kind of stuff and have like studied this their whole lives? Are they able to go mm -hmm. from life to life and remember, or is that not something that one has control over? Um, it, in most cases, it's n it's not something that you have control over, it, but it, it does, it can be cultivated. It, it, yes, it can be cultivated. Uh, it 
it just it would take you know some very very serious uh, mental reform obviously to be able to be able to get there but yes there 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 have been some masters that have um been able to disentangle themselves from the the type of fear associated with dying and the remembrance of old of old lives and um and being able to recount and take information and knowledge from those past lives and and use them in the in the present so there there ha there are people that can do this yes they're few and far between and we don't, definitely don't see them on the nightly news or anything but they they definitely do exist yes and um very often they work in in exclusive cliques of other of other types of uh, spiritual adepts and they um, they'll work in that realm to to help uh, bring about positive change in the world. Like there there are some of these groups that they're just sequestered, you know, in, in wherever it is they're residing, and they they don't they don't do much. They don't go out into society. They kind of just sit in 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 altered states of consciousness and work in that in that realm to to give influence to search out who are maybe on the cutting edge uh, in, in terms of potential for, you know, a spiritual evolution and give them ideas, um, um, uh, enter people's dreams and help them, give them guidance and, and do, just doing work, doing all this work in, in the higher realms. Um, there, there, there are groups that do this, it, like superheroes, I mean, for lack of a better term. Literally. I wanted uh, back yeah. to um, this whole lucid dreaming idea. How do you prevent yourself from waking up? Yeah. Oh, how do you prevent yourself from waking up? Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you, what you need to do to prevent, it's going to happen inevitably at some point. But um, yeah, there are some things you can do. There's one trick where you look at your hands. Okay. In order to not wake up, you need to, to be um, as closely affixed to that state as possible by immersing yourself in the world. So one thing that I would do is whenever I feel like I'm, I'm starting to wake up, the world starts kind of dematerializing and I can feel myself slipping out. One thing you would do is touch things. So in that world, in, the, in that dream state, um, I could just reach out to the closest rock or the or the ground and start touching it and start sensing it with my astral hands, okay, with my non-physical hands. Touch things, touch things, touch your arm, just go around and just make, make contact with the world and that will give your consciousness the idea that no, you're not ready to leave, you're still interacting with this world. Um, another thing you can do is you can look at your hands. This is always an interesting thing. Um, if you look at your hands when you're in the outer body state, a couple things can happen. One thing is that your hands will just melt and dematerialize right in front of your face. Or you might see hands that are different, like not exactly, you know, the way they are physically, but just different. What this is doing, it's, it's all doing the same thing. It's all just kind of fastening you to that non-physical state. And keeping you there for, for a little bit longer. But I would say the most effective thing is touch things, like interact with things, right? So if the vision is getting cloudy, just start just start reaching out and grabbing things, and then the world might rematerialize and give you a bit more uh, life in that in that state. Awesome. Man, that's it, that's super interesting. Mm -hmm. And what if one <laughs> wanted to astral project instead of lucid dream? How would that be achieved? Yeah. So um, there are many, many techniques and there are so many different types of approaches um, in order to do that. But the, the first couple steps would be similar. So the, so the first thing you would do, again, get some sleep. Uh, don't worry about projecting. Or you just, go, just go to sleep. Get up at some point early in the morning. Go back to sleep or, or lie back down. And it's at that point that you would start doing whatever it is, whatever technique. Once your body uh, is relaxed, okay, and you've you, you know you've completely calmed your mind, one famous technique is the rope technique, whereby once you're relaxed and once you're calm and once you've had a little bit of 
hypnagogic imagery kind of dance in your mind um, when I say hypnagogic imagery. It's that imagery that kind of flitters in your mind where you're not sleeping yet, but you're not completely awake yet. So you, you know you're still lying down in your bed, but you're seeing a couple of things, you know, behind your closed eyelids. That's what I mean by hypnagogic imagery, okay? And that state where you're seeing hypnagogic imagery is ideal for preparing for astral projection or lucid dreaming. So the rope technique, um, one famous technique is visualizing that you are, there's just this rope, this infinite rope, and you're just climbing the rope with your hands, just over and over and over, just in your mind, um, just going through what it would feel like if you were climbing up a rope. And that imagery can help to pull your astral body out of your physical because you're kind of giving your consciousness this idea of going upward of this point and it, and it just it happens to work that's one technique there are many there's a, a this rolling technique where you visualize yourself kind of rolling from side to side and if you're kind of on the threshold just about to go to sleep not really there you know seeing imagery and then all of a sudden you start doing this rolling technique you might find all of a sudden that there's vibrations might come over your body you might feel this just strange sensation of i don't know how to loosening for like, their english language isn't really great for this we don't have terms <laughs> that uh that really relate to this type of phenomenon so we have to do as as uh, good a job as we can but you might find this just feeling of the, a looseness of your body um disengaging from your physical and then all of a sudden boom you're in your room there are many of these techniques, um, but that would be what differentiates an, a direct astral journey from a lucid dream is that in order to directly astral project, you would, be, you would want to have some sort of loosening technique, mental loosening technique. Whereas in the, in the lucid dream, you wouldn't really need a technique. You would just need to keep your mind active. So that the world wow. materializes around you. And, and yeah, so that's that's the main difference, I would say, in, in inducing one state or another. How long did it, like, how much practice did it take for you to be able to do this? Like, this is obviously something that doesn't happen the first one, two, maybe even ten times you try it, would you say? Yeah. Yeah, correct. It, it does. Uh, I would consider myself one on the slower end of, of learning. It, it took me, um, it, it, you know, it's a trial and error process. You know, especially if you've never had any of these experiences, there's so many like little intricacies in how, what your mind does that's orienting it on what works. It can take it can take some time, but I will say this: it can often take no time at all, like zero to. Um, many people, in just listening to this alone, many people just by giving it conscious attention will either have uh, incredible dreams that night or will have, you know, uh, lucid dreams that very night. It, it, so it, it can take as little as just being mindful. Just, just wanting to be able to do it will immediately increase your, your chances of having, at the, at, the, at the least, wild dreams, amazing dreams, or memorable dreams. Um, so... If I could give advice in, you know, in what to do, how to go about it, want to do it. Have it on your mind during the day. Determine that, okay, I want to, I want to be able to do this. Um, put a, put a, put a, a dream log or a book beside your bed with a pen, you know, giving so that you're ready to write down stuff that you experience. It's, it's doing these things that tell your consciousness that you are ready to experience them and you you'd be surprised how fast how quickly you're able to make progress um literally in a day it could you know it could happen in a day but to 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 be to make it a consistent thing where you're able to just say okay here we go i'm going into the out of body state like that will take some practice but to be able to you know in a night when you go to sleep could could take no time at all i'm gonna try this like <laughs> <laughs> I get to oh, try yeah, this for yeah. sure. Like this, this sounds yeah, like the coolest thing ever. So. 
it it is it, when you, when you do have these and and you'll know it's the coolest thing ever and you will absolutely know that it is not just a dream like it's it's it is not just dreaming these are fundamentally different different phenomena uh it's and anyone who has them will tell you yeah yeah no 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 it's not dreams it's it's something else yeah it, you know what i've always been fascinated by you know the ancients specifically especially characters like marcus aurelius and plato who have had these experiences like the um the pilgrimage uh psychedelic experience that we spoke about earlier because you know how like you're talking about people who are deeply studied who who took you know philosophizing and and being very seriously and for them to have an experience that was completely life-altering actually the the pinnacle experience of one's life like it it was written by someone when Christianity, when the Roman Empire adopted Christianity and they were going to abolish this pilgrimage uh, ritual or whatever it was. Right. Somebody wrote that this is so important that you can't get rid of this because society will collapse, they thought, if you got rid of this experience. Mm-hmm. And as we know now, this is persona non grata in our society. Like even the talk of doing psychedelics or anything like that, it's like, what the heck, what are you, some kind of drug addict or something like that? Even yeah. though, you know, it, it's interesting because I'm, this isn't like a, a, pa- a by passion of mine, but having read a little bit about this and hearing people who are sort of in this realm speak about it, it has nothing to do with doing drugs. Like this is, it's completely right. absent of that, it seems, for the people who go down this pathway, right? To the point where some of them recommend it, <laughs> that like everyone should yeah. have this experience when you're ready because it's definitely not something you should do willy-nilly, right? So... Yes. Yeah, I'm super interested in this. I'm definitely going to try this lucid dreaming thing out myself. Um, I want to do yeah. s- switch gears completely off topic, you know, to kind of wrap up. This is a question I, I typically ask people. Um, what does Canada and being Canadian mean to you personally? Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Well, I mean, Canada is, um, it's a very, it's a very sought out destination for many people who are seeking a better way of life and 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 why is that and i think because in canada in my experience we what makes us canadian is is just our recognition of the inherent uh rights and freedoms that come with being a human being and i think in uh, we've definitely adopted a uh, um or our country was founded more on traditional religious uh, values, right? Traditional religious values, European, you know, the, the, Europe, the whole European movement, um, the Protestant, you know, Protestantism, Calvinism, and uh, this, this type of uh, recognition of, of moral traditional values. And um, in terms of Canadian identity, we we have uh, we have an open, accepting um, tolerance, I guess, and you know, tolerant of of people and the the rights and freedom freedoms that come with being with being a person. And uh, I, it, it's such a it's such a funny thing. It's hard for me to de- to um, uh, kind of define, right? But uh, I think I think what I would say about being Canadian. And having Canadian identity is um, a, a stronger a stronger recognition uh, of of our natural inherent rights and freedoms um, to the to the exclusion of to the exclusion of more uh, I guess tyrannical or or um, or oppressive types of uh, types of authoritarian influences now of course that's changing <laughs> that's changing now but traditionally i'm saying traditionally um that's why people want to come to canada because they they recognize that people here live in that state with this recognition of moral moral freedoms and um but you know now we've got this kind of thing overtaking the whole the whole world not 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 a, not a virus or whatever, but this type type of tyrannical tyrannical thing where we're erasing we're erasing traditional identities and we're trying to 
collectivize everyone so there are no more individual cultures. It's just this, this whole melting pot of sameness. And I think that's that's quite dangerous. Um, you know, there's sameness is an impossibility in in terms of the entire universe. We are we are all equal in uh, in our rights. In our ener- in our energies, we are all the same. Um, you know, like like a car, for example, uh, electricity. You know, electric electric power. Powers so many different things. It can power cars, it can be telephones, lights, whatever. But it's not that all of these um, electrically powered things are the exact same thing. You need the diversity amongst all of them in order to give, to provide service to different operations. And cultures and, nation- and, and nationalities. Yes, we're all, we all have the same rights under, you know, under God. We have all the same rights in nature. But that doesn't mean we should all be the same, right? Sameness is not is is not a thing. So we definitely do have a, a particular Canadian identity, in the sense of uh, how people of our land um, they they um, they relate to each other, the norms that we that we accept, the things that we accept as wrong, the the um, uh, the practices that we that we that we you know that we relate to with. Uh, one another. All of these things that make up our identity, um, as much as we are a quote unquote a multicultural nation, I think what makes Canada um, a very interesting place is that we do have this ability to integrate many different ideologies and beliefs and cultures, but while still retaining the core fundamental values that make you Canadian, right? that make you um, uh, part part of this culture um but yeah it's it's a it's a it's an interesting question because sometimes you'll hear it's like yeah canadians have no identity we don't have a culture we don't have anything we're just normal we're just neutral and and no it's not that's not that's not the case it's not that and it is something that's very difficult to define and you kind of hit the nail on the head because there's way more difference within groups than between groups right like at the core people are fundamentally individuals with an individual identity but when you come together as a nation it almost seems like there's certain things that nationalize you for lack of a better word right and historically as you pointed out it was a like a very religious european conservatism in which canada was founded on right like you had your catholicism in um quebec aka Mm -hmm. once once upon a time new france Right, and they chose to align themselves with the British to protect their own identity. So they were conserving, conserving their their identity. Um, you right. know, people who fled the United States, they wanted to preserve their attachment to the crown, so they came here to conserve that identity. Right, and it's it's interesting because the fundamental difference I think between democracy in Canada and the United States is in the U.S. They had this revolution, right? They had the American Revolution, and democracy sprung out of opposition to monarchist rule, right? To the crown. Where in Canada, democracy and freedom evolved with the crown, right? And we see, at least we have seen traditionally, as the crown as a symbol of freedom to to live under. And it, it sounds counterintuitive, you know, and if you're American, you would think that's absolutely ridiculous because... You still have this figurehead, this monarchy. But, you know, I think in the Canadian context, it's always been seen as, like, as you said, everybody's equal under God, under the crown, right? Like everyone is, has an equal starting point and the crown has represented this idea of freedom. But interestingly, over time, that conservatism in our culture, our society, our country has sort of left and made way for a liberal universalism, right? And Canadians... You know, they see, they consider themselves multicultured, right? My friend Zach Pinkin pointed this out when I was speaking to him a couple of weeks ago. He says, you know, I think it was Angela Merkel and some other European leaders had said multiculturalism is a failed policy, right? Mm-hmm. And because in their societies, they have been multicultural, like bringing in these different cultures, et cetera. But Canada, as you, I think, pointed out correctly, has woven these cultures together and you become cultured, 
right? Like you become multicultured in your experience because it's not the culture itself that's connecting you, but yeah. you know, the, the ideas and the values and like the principles of freedom that you sort of pointed out, right. That kind of hold us together, but it's not a, an easy task yeah. to consider what it is to right. have a Canadian identity. But you know, one of the yeah. reasons why I'm talking to so many people is, as I was telling you before the show is to demonstrate, Hey, that we're doing unique things and to try and parcel out what do we think it actually means to be Canadian? Because what type of country can Canada be going like, as we progress further into the 21st century, we have a landmass bigger than the Roman and Ottoman empires combined. As a friend of mine pointed out, mm-hmm. we have lots of, we have a melting Arctic, yeah. right? Like we're not going to re ice the North. Like it's not going to happen. That's right. going to open up fast right. shipping lanes, over to Asia. Like, are we going to be a vassal state to great powers or is Canada, Canada going to, you know, put its foot on the gas and become something different, like something great. I think the country could have greatness within it. If, if only we could pick it up. And I think, you know, as you were alluding to, and I, I believe this is some of what your free melon society aims to do is sort of promote this understanding that, you know, at, at some level, the people who are in charge don't necessarily need to be or they shouldn't be because I believe that they're incompetent, uh, you know, for lack of a better word, given what we've been seeing during this pandemic. Um, You know, again, another friend of mine pointed it out to me. He said when he was growing up, they fled the Soviet Union, his family, right? And he's an academic intellectual and his his father, he calls him a blue collar intellectual. And he's like, uh, you know, why do you want to get involved in politics? The country runs itself. He's like, you know what, to a certain degree, in good times, the country does run itself. And it doesn't matter if you have a Doug Ford or a Justin Trudeau in office, because it, it, it's not really relevant. Government's a machine, right? As, as you know, you know, as well, right. as well as anybody, right? However, when there's a serious crisis and a serious problem, that's when you need leadership. And where is the leadership right. now? So, you know, before I let you go, what is this? What is the Mellon Society? Mm-hmm. Oh, so yeah, my YouTube channel, run a YouTube channel, free, the, the Free Melon Society, and um, touching on many of the things that we talked about today, um, I guess uh, I would say that Free Melon Society is my uh, is the the channel that I run, whereby I I have an emphasis on health, wellness, and spirituality, and I talk about how to um, uh, how to gain those things, how to gain access to health, wellness, and spirituality, as a foundation upon which higher and higher understandings are always built. So the the, the health of your body is just I mean you 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 reside in this body, and if if any progress is to be made, um, you need to have health in your body, right? At the core fundamental level. Um, higher and higher developments become possible and more more expedient when you do have a good temple a good body a good foundation upon which to build further and further understandings so uh i focus on that and then of course we touch a little bit here and there on uh, you know on different politics and uh, natural law and uh, all, all these kind of uh, interesting topics but um but yeah uh, the, the 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 focus is is definitely on detoxification, uh, fasting, uh, you know, all, all of the things that are necessary for, for health and then get into other understandings and topics as well. Awesome, man. Well, is there anything you'd yeah. like to add? Uh, yeah, we covered some uh, pretty good ground today. I, I think guess so. I, eh? I just want to say, yeah. I just want to say thank you so much for, yeah, for having me on and, being able to catch up with you and being able to chat with uh, with your audience, I think it's I think it's wonderful. And the more we can, the more we can have these types of discussions that aren't flagged by YouTube as being you know, misleading or <laughs> or inappropriate content uh, content or whatnot. The more that we can have these discussions, I think the better for everybody because you know it's it's it is important to talk about these these types of things away from all of the you know political shenanigans and you know just talk about some real stuff right on man well thanks so much for coming on i always uh am super interested in the things that you're doing so i appreciate you taking the time and uh i hope to do it again sometime in person okay thanks a lot brother